expert mandate following a controversial election. Well, these and many other stories coming ahead in this edition of the News at 10. Thank you for joining us. back and many thanks for joining GRTS News with me, Fatima Tacham. We begin this edition of the bulletin with the presidency where the Gambian leader revealed plans to launch a massive electricity project for the community of Sami Wenyeru and its environs. As Mamudujaro reports, the move is to expand and improve on the basic necessity of rural communities. The president, president His Excellency Adam Abaro Anenturai, wrapped up engagements with a meeting in Raneru village, Sami district. The presidential motorcade braved the rough five kilometer stretch, arriving in the village amidst great fanfare. The village Alcala Omar Sinyan summed up the mood of his community, describing it as the first visit by a sitting president to this inland community. He expressed hope that the visit will mark a new beginning for Raneru and its neighboring villages, who are grappling with challenges. The representative of the youth, Serif Sala, expressed gratitude to the president for braving the rough road conditions, appealing to him to construct the five-kilometer stretch, which is the only access corridor to this part of Sami. Your Excellency, we would like to seize this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude for the already complete and ongoing development projects across the country. This is a project... This is a practical realization of the change we have been yearning for. However, Your Excellency, we would like to draw your attention to this community, which has apparently been sidelined for many years, like other parts of country where basic facilities are provided. We are also requesting your government to consider us and seriously look into the following constraints which our community has been struggling. One, poor road network connection, lack of pipe bone water, lack of health facilities, lack of cooling stations, and lack of women vegetable garden. Several other people, such as Pa Jain, Yoro Jalo, and Alaji Usman Dahaba, commended President Barra's government for the unprecedented development projects ongoing across the country, and reassured him of their support and loyalty. The meeting also witnessed the defection of several people, said to be members of the opposition, including the local UDP mobilizer Mudulami Sidibe, and the GDC councillor Demba Sow, who signed his letter of resignation. Governor Abbasanyang held the meeting as an important milestone that could potentially mark a new era for the community. The president takes your concerns very seriously, and he will do everything to address the challenges your communities face, the governor assured, thanking President Barrow for taking the initiative. The Minister of Tourism and Culture, Hamad Nkepa, said government would not allow any foreign national to be registered for elections in the country, but encourage Gambians in the diaspora to register in order to exercise their franchise. We will not encourage any non-Gambian to participate in our election. And this is the position of His Excellency's government and the government of the Gambia. What we are making very clear, Gambians, wherever they are, those who live in Mali, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry, Senegal, the whole sub-region, they have a right to come and be registered and vote in an election in this country because they are Gambians and they are welcome to do so. The tourism minister also advised NPP supporters to refrain from the politics of insults, warning that anyone who abuses the law will face the consequences. The Minister of Regional Government and Lands, Musa Drame, in response to requests, revealed that government will provide boreholes for five communities in the area and a vegetable garden for the women of Raneru. The President, His Excellency Adam Baro, commended the people of Raneru for the impressive reception, which shows that they support his government. He expressed dissatisfaction with the road condition, but reassured that his government will rehabilitate the road with gravel to improve conditions for now, with the possibility of constructing a first-class road in the future. The President further revealed that government has finalized assessments for a major electricity project for Sami and its environs, which will be launched in February. He therefore thanked the people of Sami for their loyalty and impressive turnout, urging them to be strong and steadfast. The struggle for freedom is over, President Barrow insisted, and that anyone engaged in any kind of political activism is doing so for their own personal interests. 
The president concluded his remarks, pledging a new future for Sami that will surpass the combined track record of his two predecessors. The president and entourage left Ramiro against the backdrop of heightened expectations for his home village of Mankamankunda, making several stops on the route. In Bansang, his convoy was brought to a halt as residents lined the streets to cheer the president and escort him through the main route to the outskirts of the town. Similar events unfolded as he approached Mankamankunda, with people from across the area staging a massive welcome, escorting his motorcade to his residence in an unprecedented show of numbers. The talk continues Tuesday in the Upper River region. Momodu Jalo, Still on President Barros meet the people's store within the Central River region, which now entered its second week, is the Youth and Sports Minister, Honorable Bakere Baji, who laid the foundation stone for a $9 million ministerium project. The development forms part of activities marking President Barros 2020 Meet the People's Tour. Mamadou S. Jalo is with the presidential delegation, and this is his report. Well, we apologize for not being able to bring you that report. We will do so in our subsequent editions. Now, still on state engagements, the Vice President, Dr. Aisa Tutue, has today attended a high-level policy implementation forum on supporting micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in the post-COVID-19 era. As Farmer Abadi reports, the program is organized by the Ministry of Trade, Industry, Regional Integration and Employment in collaboration with the Division of Sustainable Development Goals of UNDESA and the United Nations Development Program. We have more in this report. The coronavirus pandemic has left a devastating impact on small and medium enterprises, which will continue to hit bottom in the absence of strategic policies to support the sector's efforts to weather the effects of the crisis. The implementation of strong support policies to facilitate a post-COVID-19 era growth draws officials to a vital roundtable aimed at boosting private sector resilience with special focus on micro, small, and medium enterprises, contributing 20% to the Gambia's gross domestic product. Presiding over the opening ceremony, the Vice President, Dr. Aisha Tuture, who doubles as the designated chairperson of the National Business Council, said the recommendations will be duly implemented in keeping with government's focus on advancing the economic contribution of small businesses. In the Gambia, MSMEs contribute approximately 20% of our GDP. Thus, as a government, we recognize the significant contribution and untapped potential of MSMEs in our economy. Therefore, to unleash this potential, the MSMEs must be given special attention for their growth and sustainability. Government and its partners will do even more for the Gambian MSMEs by supporting the private sector, especially women-led MSMEs, and providing all the necessary regulations and framework to make access to finance and business registration easier. The speed of the initial wave of the pandemic blindsided the government, the private sector, and civil societies all around the world. We all rushed to solve a public health problem with a medical solution. At the GCCI, we were quick to realize and understand that COVID was a socio-economic problem for Africans and required from all the greatest social solidarity to overcome the challenges. This forum is timely for its support to the development of the MSMEs. A growing number of Gambians are turning towards macro and small enterprises that could lead sustainability after the pandemic as industry space record meltdown. The path towards recovery will entail nurturing an entrepreneurial culture among the city scenery to expand the economy. But Trade Minister Sidi Keita said there is a need to support the sector during this crucial period. We therefore recognize the need to create the enabling environment to support the sector to formalize and government will continue to engage in reforms to enhance their competitiveness. Over the years, the government has initiated a series of policies across geared towards economic transformation of the sector. However, implementation has remained a challenge 
and we must intensify our efforts, institution building and regulatory reform to ensure that we have widened the space for the private sector participation in the economy. Because of the current situation, one of the things that we want to also promote or advocate is for a stimulus package to remedy the SMEs in this difficult situation. And that is, should be as part of the COVID response in the same way to urgent actions to address the health response. Without that, you cannot talk about recovery. This forum, which brings together key national stakeholders to review the priority challenges facing MSMEs in the Gambia, is set to come up with a roadmap on how to address challenges, slowing the growth and productivity of the sector. Farmer Abadji, GRTS News. We go back to our earlier mentioned story on President Adam Abaro's Meet the People store within the Central River region, which now entered its second week, is the Youth and Sports Minister, Honorable Bakere Baji, who laid the foundation stone for a $9 million mini stadium project. Now, the development forms part of activities marking President Adam Abaro's 2020 Meet the People store. Mamoru S. Jalo has more in this report. <laughs> This is the Youth and Sports Minister, Honorable Bakari Baji, arriving at the Janjambure football field to lay the foundation stone for a $9 million mini stadium project. The laying of the foundation stone forms part of the outgoing Meet the People store, and the Sports Minister was deputizing for President Borough to launch the multi million dollar project for the youths of Janjambure and surroundings. Uh, idea, uh, also, idea also, before the request of um, 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 the, the people of Janjambure to the presidency, it was conceived by the Ministry of Youth and Sports. I think some time ago the people of Janjambure can attest to that, that we have sent technicians here to assess this very field. It was part of our programs, but all the same, since it was a direct request again to the presidency, uh, this is why we try to make sure that it is expedited, so that at least it is done immediately. And this is why um, we are gathered here today. The project is fully funded by the Gambia government and it brings the total to four mini stadiums currently being constructed around the country as part of efforts to improve the country's sports infrastructure. For far long we've all been crying that we have not had enough infrastructure in our regions. Now when it comes to sports, it's one area that has not been developed. And uh, the president, H.E., Mr. Adam Abaro, have told me, and I keep saying it, in the first day of my appointment, when I met him, the first thing he told me is that one of the things that has been a concern to him is how do we develop the infrastructure in the rural area? Because he believes that in order for us, he believes that in order for us to be able to, to excel in sports, now we have in our NDP excellence in sports. In our own mission as a ministry, one of the, the key indicators is excellence in sports. The first phase of the project will have a standard grass pitch with other facilities. And the president also believes that we can never be able to excel in sports unless we are able to have the right infrastructure in place. And the right infrastructure means that if you go across the country, not only in the greater Banjul area, but everywhere you go across the country, you will be able to see a standard football field a standard basketball field, a standard volleyball field, and where possible, a running track. These are the things that we can be able to have so that we can be able to develop our talent. Now, otherwise, you end up having young people who are very talented, but nobody is there to identify their talent. Nobody is there to help them to train to be professionals. And our dream of being developing sports into what is called sport business is never going to be realized unless we have the structure in place. The contract, the contract is awarded to Top Sport, a Gambian-owned Gambian construction, construction company, company whose representatives at the event promised quality, quality work, work and timely delivery, delivery of the project. project. The commencement of works on this sandy pitch, which is set to be transformed into a modern sports facility, excited the youths of Janjambre, describing it as historic and a dream come true. Modulam Sedikan, a youth leader and a native of Janjambure, said they have waited a long time for this moment, which is set to receive sports development in the island settlement.
Anjambra is hosting the football pitch, but it belongs to the young people of the community, the young people of the region, and most importantly, the young people of the Gambia. So it's something that we cherish, and then we're going to make sure we are so focused and we are so committed and we are so dedicated to this project so that it will be a success. We'll support the government, we'll support the contractor, we'll support each and everyone so that we are going to realize um, the completion of this project, inshallah. From here, the Minister of Youth and Sports is expected to launch two other mini stadiums in Diabugu in the Upper River region and another one in Kaur in the Central River region. And improving the rural sports infrastructure is expected to boost mass participation in sports in this part of the country. Mamadas Jalo, Jara Sports, at the Janjambure Football Field. Assembly has today endorsed the Matrimonial Clauses Amendment Bill 2020, which seeks to prevent all forms of violence against women. Louis Mendy attended proceedings of the parliamentary sittings and reports that deputies have also endorsed the 2020 Women's Amendment Bill. This is his report. The Assembly has adopted the Matrimonial Clauses Amendment Bill 2020. The bill seeks to review and amend the provisions of the principal act that are discriminatory against women and girls to be in line with the Convention on Eliminating All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. However, Saladin Namfa Sirakunda and others all supported the bill. This National Assembly uh, is taking the lead in accommodating uh, people's interpretation of words. But at the same time, we must be ready to conduct civic education so that people know that what is really the problem that we want to address is maltreating, inhuman treatment, degrading treatment against a partner, against a child, against anybody living around us. The issue really is to make uh, rape, rape in all its forms form. a crime. A crime. You need to have need the, to consent the consent of your own wife, own wife. and any and other any person. person. Matrimonial Causes Amendment Bill 2020, which was earlier scrutinized by the National Assembly Select Committee on Health, Women, women children, children, disaster, disaster humanitarian, humanitarian relief, relief, together with together personnel of the Ministry of Health, of health Child Protection Alliance, and all other stakeholders, punishes matrimonial rape. Now the JALO, the Justice Minister, brought the bill to the Parliament. For those who are worried about the gender, that male can also be raped, the petitioner is a neuter term, is a neutral term. So it could be a male, it could be a female. So if a male feel you, there was violence meted against you in a marital relationship, it is a ground. And in fact, we have male clients that go to court seeking for divorce because their female partners were violent on them. Usually not sexual violence, but some female can be violent in a relationship. So violence is a ground for seeking divorce. But sexual uh, offenses will now not necessarily have to be against the petitioner. The Women Amendment Bill 2020 was also endorsed by the NAMS on Monday. This bill asks for 30% representation of women in public offices. The bill also has it that when a woman divorces a wife she has a child with or married for over a decade, even without a child, is entitled to equal inheritance rights of the husband's property. This triggered a heated debate among NAMS as many prefer the Islamic way of inheritance, which favors men. Islam is not against fairness. If there is a property that can be proven that you contributed $100, the woman contributed $50, of course, if that becomes a dispute, there is a need for that to be established. What is the proportional contribution of each in that property and that be separated? The Women Amendment Bill 2020 also says women should get 50% share of the government scholarship when they are qualified for it. The Nam for Birika Manod, Alaji Dabo, and others wouldn't support it, but Dauda Jalo, the Justice Minister, justified the relevance as endorsed by majority of the Nams. Figures will show that women are a minimum 50% of our population. What this is only doing is reserving that half for them. If you can give 75% of scholarship to women, it will not be illegal. But if there are sufficient amount of women contenders, likewise male, 
if you give them anything less than half when they are eligible, then this law is saying that is wrong. At least give them half if you have some, if you have enough eligible qualified people. Other three bills the NAMS are expected to endorse on Monday include the civil and the Christian marriages amendment bills 2020 and the marriage women's property amendment bill. Louis Mendy, GRTS. Now, let's shift our attention to seatings of the Truth Commission, which have today witnessed one of its most prominent witnesses in the cadres of national security during the previous administration. Former Chief of Defense Staff, retired Lieutenant General Lam Tombong Tamba, made his appearance today to testify to the 1994 coup and the 2006 attempted coup, amongst other advanced mentions of him and related security matters. Sena Bujain was there and filed in the support. General Lang Tombong Tamba began his career in the forces after receiving training at the Gendarmerie and later did the recruit training at the Fajara Barracks. He told the commission that after his training in Turkey, he was appointed as the Director of Operations at the Gambia National Gendarmerie and being appointed as the Lieutenant of the Presidential Guards at the State House and served under Sir Dauda Karaba Jawara. The former Army CDS explained the events of the 1994 coup as he was the commander on the ground. We want to know what was happening at the two points of attack or two points of arrival. They approved the state house in two groups. Also, if indeed state house can fund out for One of the groups was led by Edward Sinatra. From which direction? He came to Independence Drive to the market square from the market end, coming up to close to the entrance to the former um, health, Ministry of Health, their, their warehouses, where they used to issue bad certificates, and he stopped there with his team. Then um, at the state house, the other side, that is the Marina Gate, I got reports from the officer who was assigned there, that is um, Lieutenant Sonko. We have several Lieutenant Sonkos in the past. Which one are you referring to? Well, actually not Usman Sonko, I can't remember the name. It's from Yomi N. Where is he? Ali? He's late now, I understand. He was in the UK and later he's late. He reported citing the former president Yahya Jame with his group on the main road just around um, social welfare offices there. The witness told the commission that after having their armory seized and being outnumbered by Edward Singate's men, he had to surrender because he knew it would be a bloody coup if they fought with what they had. I fought the 2006 coup, said Lang Tombong Tamba, as he told the commission that he received intelligence from Bo Baji that a coup was in the works by late CDS Noor Cham. I was the one who spoke to the president and gave him assurance that he could return that night back to Banyu. So you foiled the coup essentially? I led the, the team that foiled the coup. Okay, fine, good. Yes. So, Daba Marena, mm -hmm. was he part of the coup or was he not part of the coup? Daba Marena, to my knowledge, Daba Marena was not in the country. We all know that. I am the question coming. is, was he part of the coup or was he not? I am coming. We are coming. Dava Marena traveled along with the president. Dava Marena and the president were traveled along with From the evidence that was put before us, there was no implication made of Dava Marena's involvement. Dava Marena, the data of the coup, in our panel. Nobody mentioned about Dava Marena's involvement. No woman Dava was mentioned by one of the witnesses. In what context can you recall? We are aware that he was informed. One of the witnesses certified that. In a back-and-forth exchange with the lead counsel, witness Tamba disclosed that Bunja Dabo was the first to be arrested in connection to the foil coup. In another back-and-forth exchange with lead counsel, Chairman Lamin Sise interjected to explain what and how the commission is supposed to be. Sittings with the same witness continues tomorrow at 10 a.m. Sainabu Jain for JRTS News. Retired 
on now, the Ministers of Agriculture and Environment have today presided over the closure of the National Agricultural Land and Water Management Development Project, NEMA, in Kololi. The seven-year project worth 34 million U.S. dollars, funded by the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, focused on watershed development and agricultural commercialization to promote production and improve livelihoods of small farmer holders. Usman Mana reports. The $34 million NEMA project and activities with an official ceremony declaring its closure after seven years. The ceremony could not go further without a minute of silence in memory of late Director Modu Gasama, who tirelessly contributed to the success of the project. In his welcome speech, the acting director of NEMA project, Lamin Fatajo, described the development program as one of the comprehensive initiatives implemented to impact the lives and livelihoods of small farmer holders in the country. The country director of IFAD, our center, highlighted the priorities of the project, key among which is reducing poverty among farmers. We are today at the time of the result. And it's and great pleasure great and satisfaction, and satisfaction for, me for me to see, see the, the achievement, achievement and, progress and progress made by the made project by the over the past over seven years. Year. By reaching by more reaching than 45,096 45, vulnerable, vulnerable as well, of which 51% 51 51 are women, 33.5% are youth are people, the project, the project has, has been able, able to achieve, achieve its initial, initial objective, objective, including improving, improving the light blue blue of a rural woman and young and people through investment in infrastructure and market linkage. The Minister of Agriculture, Ami Fabre, noted the impact of the project towards supporting the agriculture value chain. She further dilated on the significance of the project in achieving national development blueprints that seeks to support agricultural production and productivity. The project has achieved its impact targeted for reduced poverty of rural women and their youth for almost 45,968 producer households. All of the following results achieved together have a combined positive effect on overall poverty reduction for beneficiaries. Having a symbiotic relationship, the Agriculture and Environment Ministry have been working to enhance the resilience of farmers and communities. The Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources Minister Lamin B. Diva highlighted some of the efforts his office undertook during the course of the project. At the level of the departments and CBOs under my ministry, the project provided funds for the implementation of community forest restitution subcomponent named Community, community agroforestry, agro community, community woodlots, wood lots, and tree, and tree mangrove, mangrove restoration. restoration. And, and for the and information of this gathering, this, gathering this, year, this year, we have planted, we have planted over planted one million trees, trees including, including go, um, mangroves. Beneficiaries, Beneficiaries recount their success, success stories, stories, including, including increased household, household incomes. incomes. Habib Job Habib of Heritage, Heritage Holding benefited, benefited from the project margin grant, margin grant and he is into he is food into processing. processing. In 2019, we were awarded a grant through NEMA's capital investment stimulated, uh, stimulated fund in order to establish a light industry on the processing and packaging of chili powder using chili peppers whose production is outsourced to smallholder farmers who are predominantly women in community gardens currently across the West Coast region. We hope to engage more farmers across the country as we expand and diversify. Following the closure of the NEMA project, the Gambia is set to launch an 80 million US dollar project which seeks to achieve food security and resilience to climate change, thus the resilience of organizations for transformative smallholder agriculture project. Usman Mane, GRTS. The Gambia-Angola-China holding company Gach Group on Sunday laid the foundation stone for a 12 by 12 meter mosque at Diabugoba Tapa village. The ceremony held at Sandu district in the upper river region is worth $2.2 million. Majan Baro picks up the rest of that story. Unity, the construction of a standard mosque is always welcomed by the hundreds of worshippers who gather for congregational prayers on daily basis. Here in Diabogu, Patapa, in the Sandu district of Upper River region, senior citizens, including both men and women, as well as the young, gather to lay the foundation stone of their first major community mosque. 
main beneficiaries such as Marabu Muhammad Drame, Al Haji Surahata Jawara, Haja Nene Suso, and Jahara KS Jawara. All thank the CEO of Gaj Group, Abu Bakari Jawara, describing the development as an important one for Muslims in the community. The philanthropist, the, in the name of Alai Abu Bakar Jawara. We are appreciative of the wonderful job that you have done here. And we are appealing to all and others, all and sundry, as some of the speakers have mentioned. There is still a lot of work to, to be done. Looking around this area, as you can see the classrooms, you have incomplete classrooms. As far as, far as the land is concerned, it's not a problem. We need scholars, we need more schools, we need more teachers. Definitely we need more help. To the CEO of Guide Group, the idea of building a mosque in the village came when he brought his nephew to Marabu Mohammed Drame for treatment. treatment. Oh, that's a traditional treatment. Uh, I visited the village for the treatment of my nephew and realized that the Marabu needs help especially with the mosques in the community's Quranic school. I decided to do it for the sake of Allah. I will urge people to come out and further help develop the country because the government can't do it alone. Look at the new PIU headquarters in Basse, worth $1.7 million is under construction. It's all under philanthropic gesture. To the villagers, the CEO of Gaj Group is continuing a family practice that started from his grandparents, Majan Baro, for GRTS News. In attention to the country's music industry where the interim executive of the Gambia Music Union recently held a press conference to update the public about its constitutional review and the COVID-19 relief package that's ahead of their Congress to be held later this month. By Ibrahim Cham was at the presser and this is his report. The interim the executive, executive of the Gambia, of the Gambia, Gambia Music, Music Union, Union recently, recently held a press, held press conference, conference to update, to update the, public the public on its constitutional, constitutional review exercise, exercise COVID-19 funds, funds, and Congress to be held, to be held later, later this month. This month. According to the According interim to the executive of the union, the, union, the autonomous, autonomous body is not, is not working under the dictates of the National of the Center National for Arts and Culture, and Culture and CAC. Pam Sar, an executive, an executive member, member of the music union, union stated, stated that, that after numerous, after numerous correspondence to acquire its COVID-19 relief funds, funds, summing up to $250,000 from the NCAC to organize its Congress, appropriation of the funds to some of their activities has become an issue. The director, Mr. Seumajal, specifically said that uh, uh, moving on, moving they are going to be the ones to take care of Congress. And uh, what they're going to do is uh, they're going to take 50,000 uh, from the 250,000 that was allocated to, to musicians. Of course, all artistic associations, but I need, to be, I need to be specific about the musicians in here. 250,000 is specifically used uh, for Congress. Now they are only going to use 50,000, which they will take. And then organize Congress for us. We come and do our Congress, and after that, after the newly elected executive that will come into office will now use that uh, uh, 200,000 or 250,000 minus 50 will definitely give you uh, 200,000. So that 200,000 is what they are now going to pump into the account of the of the new executive, so that they can have an administrative cost that they can use to work on. So, so. Uh, that has that not has been our communication with them from the onset, and uh, we felt that it is very, very wrong that we were treated really bad after having consultation way back from them coming now. How could you allow us to have consultation with you? Tell us this is the reason why we cannot give you this money. Up to the last minute, and now you're telling us that in fact we are going to take care of everything and we are going to use your 50,000 into this. Now, we have a position on that. And that is one of the uh, reasons why we organize for this Congress, and that is to say, NCAC, uh, a message was sent to them to email to say, the 250,000 that is allocated for Congress, please, please keep the 50,000 and the 200,000 together. Let us have 250,000 ready for the next executive coming in. Moving on, as a joint committee, we are going to make sure we get the money to organize this this press conference, to organize constitutional review, to also organize Congress, to make sure 
that that 250,000 is intact when it is time for it to be transferred to the coming executive. Interim executive, Interim executive members are currently are reviewing the constitution, the constitution of the Music, of the music union, union with a proposed Congress, Congress to be held into this, this month. Reporting for DRTS, DRTS News, News and by Brahim Chan. Now, still on matters of the arts and creative sector, we earlier spoke to the Director of Creative and Performing Arts at the National Center for Arts and Culture, Mr. Sheikh Omar Jalo, in this interview. Let's take a listen. The which is the Center for Arts and Culture, was promulgated by an Act of Parliament, which is uh, 2000, the NCAC, NCAC Act 2004. 2004. And in that and in Act, it actually states that the National, the National Center, for Center for Arts and Culture is responsible, is responsible for the preservation, preservation promotion, promotion, and development, and development of, the of the tangible and intangible cultural, cultural heritage, heritage, which means which tangible is, is the touchable you know, images that is like the Jufure, the museum, the wall acclaimed heritage sites. Sites, you know, you like, know, like uh, stone uh, circles and the like. And, and the culture and creative, creative industry, industry, which is the intangible aspect of it, and that's and what that's falls under my office. office. Okay. And in and that in regard, regard, you have all the creative, all the creative sectors. sectors. There is there nine is creative, creative, creative sectors, sectors in the Gambia. And this and is this music union, you know, uh, sorry, the literary art section, which is the where you have the writers. And then, of course, the publishers, the book publishers, you name them. And you have also the performing art industry. The performing art industry is where you have characterized is characterized by the music union like the musician sector the theater the uh, visual arts the, uh, the 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 fashion and of course you have all those things that are compacted in the performing arts sector mm -hmm. and you have the fine arts where you have you know the handicraft workers the catchy text and you know the uh, the visual artists right. basically now, we know COVID-19 has opened it, I mean, every sector of, of, of this country. Now, the music industry, the performing arts industry is no exception. Talk to us about how exactly the COVID-19 pandemic has affected your industry. Yeah, of course. In fact, I think the COVID-19 and uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic was directly affecting two sectors, okay. basically, to me. Mm -hmm. It's the sports and the creative industry, because these are the two sectors where they live by getting spectators getting yeah, exactly. people together mm -hmm. because apart from this there is no other job where you need people to come together but because this ones you make the money some people may disagree <laughs> yeah no no this there is no no other profession mm -hmm. that you make the money by gathering more people mm -hmm. because with the art sector the more people you gather the more money you have the richer you become you should do is rich or all these big artists are rich because they have gathered some millions of people right. together and that's where they, they make their money. Right. And the same thing with football. So if that is being cop and it's not functional, it's being banned, right. then we have a problem. Obviously, it affects the industry. Exactly. Now, like you've mentioned, your industry is one of the hardest hit, separate and apart from sports. Absolutely. Now, we know funds are available to remedy that particular situation. Talk to us about that. Yeah, of course, the Gambia government, under the leadership of His Excellency, uh, Dr. Um, Adam Abaro, mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, my minister, with the help of my minister, the, uh, the Samad Ba, mm -hmm. um, that's the Minister of Tourism and Culture. The tourism and culture sector is being given um, at least a COVID-19 relief fund. Okay. And, of course, of no exception, the, sec the sector also for culture practitioners was also, of course, given some. Mm -hmm. And in that, we had taken a strategy so as to be able to distribute it for registered individual artists, registered groups, associations, griots, traditional communicators, you know, traditional rulers, and of course, we have extended it even to veterans, those who are posthumous. That was Sheikh Omar Jalo. He's the Director of Creative and Performing Arts at the National Center for Arts and Culture, the NCAC. Ali is speaking to GRTS on some clarifications regarding government response towards the COVID-19 fund, as well as some concerns raised by the interim executive members of the Gambia Music Union. Now. Imam Buhari Center for Islamic Studies on Sunday inaugurated two boreholes at Welingara and Suntu Sinjang in Funyi. More on the humanitarian intervention seeking to provide easy access to portable supply of water is Kadigetu Jalo. The center continued to support communities across the country with facilities to access portable water. 
two communities in the West Coast settlement of Wilingara and Sutu Xinjiang in Fonyi are the latest beneficiaries of the group's humanitarian gesture, delivering urgently needed assistance to grassroots communities. Beneficiaries were greatly appreciative of the boreholes and recall challenges they frequently encounter in accessing water. Uh, the people of Wilingara, especially this area, have been crying for water for the past almost 20 years. We have our taps in, the, in our compound, in the various compounds, but there is no water coming from the taps. So, but with the intervention of Imam Buhari, when they came here last week to do a survey, they realized that most of the compounds around the end are not having water. So they came and then they dig this borehole for the community of uh, this area. Women in Wellingara took turns to share their joy in the development provided by the Imam Buhari Foundation, which is rolling out significant projects bringing portable water to disadvantaged communities. So to Xinjiang village elders also hail Imam Bukhari for the role they are playing in easing grassroots challenges, noting that government cannot do it all alone. Wonderful gesture, and I hope this will be uh, a replica in other communities, not only Sutu Xinjiang. Uh, water is essential. Without water, uh, life is zero. So I think uh, uh, Chairman BDC, the Water Committee, the Alkali, the Imam, and the entire community of Sutu Xinjiang should be uh, in a position to take care of this stuff. Speaking at the inauguration ceremony, officials of the Imam Bukhari Foundation said the donation support aims to promote Islam by building mosques, schools, and providing access to water. Uh, your government cannot do it all. So we have to partner and see how best we can address uh, these issues. So this goal is very important because even the, way, the, the place where it is placed is a strategic position. The new borehole were built, built in response to communal, to communal needs, needs faced, faced by, by these communities, communities who, are who are now being challenged, being challenged to take ownership of the program, of the program to, sustain to sustain the facility. Khadija Tujalo, reporting for the Artist News. Over now to a press release from the Gambia Tourism Board, and it reads, In our efforts to open the 2020-2021 tourist season, GT Board, in consultation with the Ministry of Health and Partners, has developed protocols and guidelines to ensure the health and safety of tourists and locals alike. The office has also adopted the World Travel and Tourism Council Safe Travel Stamp in a bid to boost global confidence in the sector. Subsequently, the release continued, GT Board wishes to inform the general public, especially its stakeholders, that the mandatory protocols and guidelines for the tourism industry will be fully implemented and enforced effective the 21st of December 2020. All managers and owners of tourism-related businesses, such as hotels, guest houses and lodges, restaurants and bars, nightclubs and casinos, etc., are all urged to contact the inspectorate unit for inspection and subsequent clarification. Or rather call the authority on 796-58380-710-9081. The release concludes. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of the news at 10 p.m. But before we go, a quick look at our top stories this hour. The President's Excellency Adam Abaro has revealed plans to launch a massive electricity project for the community of Same Renieru as he entered the second week of his Meet the People's Tour. Vice President Dr. Isaac Ture has presided over the high-level policy implementation forum on supporting micro, small and medium-sized enterprises in the post-COVID-19 era. And former Chief of Defense Staff of the Gambia Armed Forces, retired Lieutenant General Lantombong Tamba, today testified before the Truth Commission.
and in sports, a five-day football seminar on basic techniques of coaches and refereeing has ended at the Central River region. And on the internationals, Ivory Coast new president Alassane Ouattara has been sworn into office for a third mandate following a controversial election. Well, that was all in this edition of the news at 2200 hours. From me, Fatima Techam, and the rest of the team on duty, we wish you a wonderful evening and keep watching GRTS.